All right, we are talking influenza today, and uh, obviously there's a fair number of similarities, at least in terms of transmission and some of the symptoms between influenza and COVID, so uh, I may try to highlight some of those similarities as we go through the chapter. But I'm going to have this split into two videos. The first half, which is going to be the longer video, um, we'll go over a little bit of background, just taxonomy, talk about some of the different subtypes of influenza. We'll go through basic clinical course of infection, and then talk about some molecular virology, which would be the, basically the replication cycle of the virus. All right, so we're all familiar with influenza, with the flu. We've probably all, all had the flu at some point in our lives. If not, you're very lucky. Uh, this is a negative sense single-stranded RNA virus. It's enveloped and has a segmented genome. And there's three main types. There's influenza A, B, and C. Um, all three can infect humans, although there are some differences in terms of host range and other organisms, as you can see here. Um, influenza C is usually subclinical in humans, meaning it doesn't typically make people sick. So it's usually influenza A and B uh, when we're talking about disease and illness. And primarily, influenza A accounts for the, the vast majority, about two-thirds of human infections every year. And so, just to give you a little intro, and we'll come back to this um, when we talk about some of the molecular virology, but the, the different subtypes of influenza, which you might be familiar with, you might have heard of, you know, H1N1 or something like that, is referring to a, a individual subtype. And those subtypes are determined by these two envelope glycoproteins, the hemagglutinin, or HA, or just simply H, protein, which you see here in gray, and then the neuraminidase, or Na, or just N, which you see here in uh, green. So we'll talk about the functions of these, but primarily HA is involved with attachment, and Na uh, is involved with release. But uh, these are important uh, designations as subtypes because they're also, since they're on the surface of the virion, as you can see here, these are really the main antigens that are recognized by the human immune system. So if you have immunity or not to a specific subtype, it really depends on what those glycoproteins look like. Okay, so there's, there's a lot of different uh, versions or, or flavors of the H and N proteins, in particular the H. You can see there have been 18 different uh, varieties of that particular glycoprotein identified. A large number found in birds, three main H types in humans, one, two, and three, but then there's also a few others here that have crossed over from, from bird flus, avian influenzas, to, to humans. Um, and similar but slightly smaller list with the, the N uh, glycoprotein. Again, lots in birds and then a couple in humans with a few, a few that have transferred over from avian flus as well. Um, so yeah, like I said, you always, you always see these strain designations, right, referring to which combination of the H protein and N protein are you finding in that particular flu virus. And there are some uh, internationally accepted naming conventions when it comes to influenza viruses. And you've got the text here, but I'm just going to jump to the next slide, which shows you what those names would look like. Um, so you have a human flu virus here up top. You've got the type. Is it A, B, or C? Uh, where did it originate? I'm assuming this one was from Perth, Australia. You have a strain number, the year it was isolated, and then that subtype, H3N2 in this case, designation. Um, it's going to be about the same if you're talking about non-human influenzas, but you also have a species of origin uh, tucked in there between the virus type and the, the uh, place of origin. So you get those pretty detailed names, right? If you, if you have that name, you know quite a bit about that virus.
And in terms of the clinical course, you know, something we're, we're probably all too familiar with, because as I, as I said, most of us have probably had influenza, um, but it's obviously, it's a respiratory virus, right? It's transmitted by droplets or aerosols that are primarily generated when people are coughing or sneezing, but could even come from just speech or uh, singing, you know, really, really anything that might get uh, aerosolized particles or droplets out of your mouth or nose could transmit the virus. And so those those droplets or aerosolized particles could be inhaled, usually by somebody that's in close contact, or of course it could be through surface transmission, right, where somebody's sneezed on, you know, on their hand and then touched a doorknob and then somebody touches the doorknob and uh, puts their puts their hand to their mouth or their eyes or, or whatever. Um, the influenza virus primarily likes the ciliated epithelial cells that are in your respiratory tract. And so just to point out, you know, your entire respiratory tract is lined with epithelial cells, but they are a different type. So you have like squamous epithelium in your nose, in your oropharynx. You've got these ciliated columnar epithelial cells in your sinuses, and then all through your larynx, trachea, bronchi. Um, in the bronchioles, you have some ciliated cuboidal epithelium, then some non-ciliated cuboidal, until you get deep down in the lungs and those alveoli, you've got just a thin layer of squamous epithelium again. So again, the, the influenza virus primarily prefers to infect these uh, different varieties of ciliated epithelium. And there's, as you can see, there's quite a lot of that to choose from if you're an uh, influenza virus. Um, and yeah, another thing to mention, so as the virus infects those cells, it will actually destroy the cilia. And the role of the cilia here is to sweep debris out of your respiratory tract. So that's going to um, oftentimes contribute to maybe some secondary infections, right? If, if those cilia are gone, they're not sweeping bacteria out anymore, and you're more likely to develop a bacterial uh, pneumonia associated with that flu infection. All right, so in terms of just straight clinical course, your incubation period is relatively short, certainly much shorter than COVID, right? We're at about two weeks. This is just one to four days with an average of just a couple of days. Um, and about half of people infected are gonna get this classic list of symptoms that we're probably all too uh, aware of. You know, pretty rapid onset fever, usually in the low 100s, but could potentially be higher. That's going to last for at least a couple of days. Muscle aches or myalgia, typically in the back or the shoulders. Um, you know, fatigue, headaches, sore throat, runny nose, all that stuff, potentially. Nausea and vomiting. Um, you know, that dry, scratchy cough, not productive. So again, um, you're not clearing mucus from your lungs, so that can also help collect uh, bacteria and contribute to secondary infections. So you'll typically have these symptoms for anywhere from three to five days, although some of them, in particular the cough and fatigue, can go on for potentially weeks. Um, as, as I'm sure you're also aware, right, a lot of these symptoms are very similar to what you might have with a cold or even with some allergies. But uh, in terms of things you would not find if you have a cold versus the flu with a cold, you won't get the, the muscle aches. You usually won't get the extreme fatigue. I mean, you're not going to feel great with a cold, but um, usually not excessively tired and you typically won't have a fever. So if you have any of those three, that might be a... Uh, tip off that you have flu versus a cold. Um, of course, the fever, uh, at least, is one of the key symptoms now in terms of COVID as well. All right, so shedding of the virus, right, the basically the host releasing virus and, and being infectious can happen from the day before your symptoms uh, first appear to five days after they've started. So you basically have this six day period. And it, there've been some studies showing that children can shed for a little bit longer. And uh, you know, you're probably aware of the fact that COVID 
right? People are have been found to be infectious for uh, up to two weeks before they show any symptoms, and then, you know, potentially for for two weeks while they're while they're symptomatic or even longer, uh, depending on the course of their infection. And you you may be aware, right? The biggest risk uh, in terms of serious disease or death from influenza, as well as with COVID, comes from very young, very old people that may be immunocompromised or have other chronic health conditions. And we'll have a, a discussion for them uh, talking about some of these in particular in relation to COVID. Um, but, you know often the most serious and common um, complication comes from development of pneumonia due to these secondary bacterial infections that I, that I alluded to. So strep pneumonia, um, Haemophilus influenza, you know, there's a, a whole list of bacteria that, that could be an issue. Um, if you already have some respiratory or pulmonary issues, right, that could that could definitely put you at higher risk as well. And there have been about 10% of people with the flu, serious flu, um, showing inflammation of the heart, myocarditis. And they've seen this some um, with uh, COVID-19 as well, even in younger, uh, relatively healthier patients. There was a, a new article out I just saw showed a, a relatively high percentage of uh, college athletes, I think it was at Penn State, if I remember correctly, it was like 30-some percent were showing uh, myocarditis. Um, we all know influenza peaks in the cold weather months, right? So it varies from year to year. You can see peaks of a few different cold uh, flu seasons here, uh, but usually between December and March, could be a little earlier or later, depending on the particular year. And, you know, we think in part that maybe because the lower humidity in the air and the colder weather um, may promote the, the ability of some of those droplets or aerosolized particles to linger in the air longer and travel a little farther. And also, of course, you've got people spending more time indoors and in closer contact to each other during those colder months. Uh, WHO estimates that there's up to about half a million deaths worldwide uh, each year that could be attributed to influenza. In the U.S., uh, it's believed that there's maybe a quarter of a million hospitalizations. Um, and as, as I already suggested, you know, the vast majority of influenza-associated deaths are in people 65 years of age or older. All right, so let's uh, talk about some of the molecular biology, bi virology, basically how the influenza virus is doing its thing. And we'll come back to this cartoon that we've already seen showing the virion. So we already talked about the glycoproteins HA and NI on the surface. This is enveloped, right? So those glycoproteins are protruding from the, the viral envelope. Um, we've got the single-stranded um, bipartite genome here, right? You can see those single-stranded RNA molecules. The virion itself is said to be pleomorphic, just meaning it can vary its shape a little bit, nothing too dramatic, but it's typically either spherical or maybe just slightly elongated. Um, we've got those genome segments that I just mentioned, the single-stranded RNA. Influenza A and B have eight segments, and C has seven. Um, but we'll mostly focus on A and B since those are the ones that cause human disease. And if we zoom in on the, on the RNA, um, you'll see that the RNA is actually wrapped around these nucleocapsid proteins, which is a little unusual. Usually the nucleocapsid would surround the RNA to protect it. Um, but it seems that uh, just that association, even though the viral RNA is still exposed, that association with the nucleocapsid protein, or the NP as it's abbreviated, provides some level of protection. So each one of these blue circles is a nucleocapsid protein that's bound to about 24 nucleotides of uh, RNA. And it's the whole, whole shebang is twisted into this helix. Um, and then at the end, you have attached the uh, 
RNA polymerase, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which is a complex of three proteins, so PA, PB1, PB2. We'll talk about the function of those uh, a little bit later when we, when we get into replication and transcription. Um, but as you saw in the previous slide, right, each, each segment of the genome exists as one of these uh, separate ribonucleoprotein complexes with its own RNA polymerase attached. Uh, just to give you kind of quick overview of the genome, so here's those eight segments that you find in influenza A, um, segment uh, uh, one and two, you've got PB1 and uh, PB2. Um, you have this little alternative reading frame here that can give you this little F2 protein um, if translated, and that can induce apoptosis of immune cells. Um, segment 3, PA, and you've got the HA in segment 4, um, the NA that we talked about in segment 6, that nucleocapsid protein is encoded on segment uh, 5, and then 7 and 8 are M1 and NS1. And you have these alternate reading frames there that can give you another two proteins, M2 and NS2. And I mentioned influenza C has one less segment, and that's because it doesn't have separate HA or NA proteins. All right, so what are some of those other proteins that, that we just mentioned doing? Well, we already talked about the glycoproteins, right? HA is important for attachment. NA is going to be important for virus release. And we'll look at, at HA doing its job here in a few slides. In fact, we've already talked about it in a previous lecture. Um, but that HA protein is actually derived from this precursor called HA0 that is cleaved into two two subunits. So there's the HA1 and HA2 subunits that remain bound to each other. So when we say HA here, it's really a complex of HA1 and 2. And as we'll see, HA1 is important for the initial attachment of the virus. HA2 is really important for uncoding at the uh, endosomal membrane. Uh, we've also got the M1 or the matrix protein, so these purple circles here. And as with all envelope viruses, you have this matrix protein, right, that's found just under the surface of the viral envelope and may facilitate interactions with any uh, uh, nucleic acid structure inside the virion. And the, this matrix protein is the most abundant protein in a uh, influenza virion. So there's about 3,000 of these in each, each and every virion. So a lot of matrix protein being made. You have this M2 protein, which we see here. So there's the purple, um, purple structure here that spans the viral envelope. And so this actually acts as an ion channel, and this will be important for fusion and basically uncoding again at the endosome. I'll come back and mention this uh, in a few slides here. Um, then we've got uh, NS1 and NS2, which are, are not shown in this image, but NS1 um, basically blocks interferon production in, in hosts, so suppressing the immune response. NS2 is this nuclear export protein, and it's going to help the, the newly formed viral particles get out of the nucleus. And we'll, we'll come back in a minute here and talk about the fact that influenza virus is kind of unusual and that it's a, an RNA virus that does like to go in the nucleus. It's part of its replication cycle. So I won't go through this, but here you've got a table again, just some summarizing all the different proteins that are part of the uh, influenza virus genome, their size and their specific functions, most of which we just went through. Okay, so of course the first part of any uh, virus replication cycle is attachment. And just to set the stage here, you remember this virus likes those ciliated epithelial cells in your respiratory tract. And you will find um, these uh, cell surface proteins that have these sugars attached to them. Um, and typically you'll have a sialic acid um, at the very end of those chains 
and then a galactose uh, just just next to that. Um, so we would say the galactose is the penultimate sugar. It's a good term there, next to last. Um, and you could that that bond between the galactose and the sialic acid could really be one of these two different types of linkages. So it could be an alpha two six linkage shown here, or an alpha two three linkage shown here. And human influenzas typically prefer that alpha two six linkage, whereas the the bird flus, the avian influenzas prefer the alpha-2-3 linkage. And just kind of tuck that away when we come back later in the chapter and talk about bird flus. Uh, this is going to tie in with one of the reasons we think bird flus tend to be uh, much more severe in humans in, in many cases. So we have that attachment between the HA and that sialic acid. You can see that here right on the surface of those ciliated epithelial cells. Um, then we get penetration, and most of the time influenza virus is taken in by clathrin-mediated endocytosis, such that it ends up inside an endosome, and uncoating usually happens in the endosome through the process of fusion, which I showed you in an earlier chapter, um, but we'll look at it again briefly here. So uh, just remember you have the, the HA1 part of that that HA glycoprotein really initiated that initial attachment. So it, it bound to what was the plasma membrane and is now um, part of that endosomal membrane. And then you have the viral envelope here. So the HA1 will actually move out of the way and allow the other HA subunit, HA2, to dig into the endosomal membrane. And then this whole complex will undergo a conformational change um, along with a, another complex that is next door. So you've got two complexes side by side. And as they both change their conformation, they'll draw the endosomal and the viral envelope together, creating a pore that is now going to allow the viral nucleic acid molecules to escape into the cytoplasm. And I mentioned the M2 protein, which was the ion channel, so uh, in, that you find in the viral envelope. It's going to allow hydrogen ions, hydronium ions, to get into the virion, and that's going to disrupt sort of the, the secondary structure um, that is kind of holding those uh, ribonucleic acid particles in place and really fully allow them to become released this example. So that's happening at the endosome, right, in the cytoplasm, but as I mentioned, influenza virus is unique in RNA viruses in that it likes to go into the nucleus. Typically you only see that with DNA viruses, as you, you all gave me good answers regarding why that was the case on the, the first exam. Um, so the those nucleic acid particles, right, will go through the nuclear pore into the nucleus and that's where transcription, genome replication are going to happen. We'll look at those here in a second. So uh, transcription and replication are going to be carried out by that RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which remember consisted of three subunits, three proteins, and those were attached to the end of the, the nucleic acid. Um, and so we're going to make two uh, positive sense viral RNAs from the, the original negative sense viral RNA that entered the nucleus. One of those will be a messenger RNA that we can use to make proteins, and the other will be this complementary RNA that's also called the antigenome that's going to be used as the template to now make uh, new copies of the genome for packaging up into new virions as they assemble. And just to show you what this looks like in just a little bit of detail, uh, this whole process begins with this kind of strangely named cap snatching. And this is referring to five prime caps that you find at the five prime end of eukaryotic messenger RNAs, right? So it's important for translation for ribosomes to be able to recognize these RNAs as ready for translation. And since the viral RNA doesn't doesn't have that cap, it will actually steal one from the host uh, uh, messenger RNAs. 
And so this is uh, PB1 and PA are primarily involved with, with that process, with uh, binding to the cap and then cleaving it off. Um, PB1 will then uh, basically start adding new nucleotides. This is really the polymerase activity now. We'll start adding new nucleotides onto the end of that cap um, using the, the viral messenger or the viral genomic RNA as the template, right? So we're making that that uh, viral messenger RNA now. And at the end, that polymerase will stutter a little bit and give us the poly A tail. So we end up with what the cell now is going to recognize as a, a ready to be translated messenger RNA with the five prime cap and the poly A tail. And of course for translation to happen, this messenger RNA has to leave the nucleus, right, back out the nuclear pore and go uh, join up with the ribosome. So after you've got enough of these viral proteins being produced through this process we just looked at, the RDRP in, in by some unknown mechanism kind of gets switched over into the genome replication mode. Um, so it will crank out that complementary DNA that will then just be used as template for making new uh, new genome copies, right? Without the without the five prime cap and without the poly A tail, um, you have the the M1 protein assisting with with uh, the RNP form formation, right? Putting together those new ribonucleoprotein uh, particles. And so then in terms of assembly, maturation, release, uh, influenza virus will assemble at the plasma membrane. So you'll have some of those HA and NA proteins, right, basically being uh, produced and sent to this, the cell surface to the plasma membrane. You'll have the matrix protein coding a specific region of the plasma membrane there. And all of these proteins are going to act to produce to recruit those newly produced ribonucleic uh, acid protein complexes to that site. Everything will just bud out. Um, and then interestingly, as, the, as, as that budding process happens, Na is going to cleave the sialic acid from any of the, the cell surface proteins. Um, so that additional influenza virus, when it comes along, won't be able to reinfect this cell. It's basically kind of marking it as mine, right? I've already infected this one. Go find another cell to infect. And without that sialic acid, right, a new influenza virus just wouldn't be able to bind. All right, so I will stop there and pick this up in part two.